My mom is a great lady, absolutely wonderful. Uh, but ever, whenever she gets lost, she always blames Google Maps. Right? And she always says, that stupid thing sent me down the wrong road. And I remember once or twice traveling with her and I observed why Google Maps always sends her down that stupid thing, always sends her down the wrong road. Uh, it's because when it would say, turn left in 200 meters, she'll take the next left. Not the, two, not the one 200 meters, but like the next one, the next one. Uh, like, as, as, watch the map, watch the map. What, it says left, it doesn't say go left. Now it says go left in 200 meters. So watch the map, watch the map. And that's, you know, if we follow the instructions as they're given, I've actually, I've, I've had really good experiences with Google Maps, so I, I don't know. I think it works for me anyway. Uh, if you follow the instructions as they're given, it works. Uh, if we take an instruction and then act at the wrong time, you end up going down the wrong road. You end up in Valley Sagart or somewhere, like when you're aiming for Sligo, you know what I mean? So, like, it's not just about hearing the instruction, but it's about knowing when to apply that instruction, how to apply that instruction. When some people think of marriage, I think this is a, a, a fairly, a fairly uh, ideal view of marriage. Uh, some people head into marriage thinking it'll be great when I get married because the other person will take care of all of my needs. And so I will have someone who will take care of me. I will have someone who, uh, whatever I need, whenever I need it, they will provide. And that's what marriage is all about. One goes into marriage and all one has to do is receive. Isn't that it? That how it works? No? <laughs> no, it isn't. It really isn't how it works. When I think people get married, they realize, holy cow, this is a, there's a lot more to this than I thought, right? Um, it's nice, yes, to have someone beside me and someone that I can walk with and someone I can work with and someone who I can love and someone who loves me, but there's also a whole lot required of me, a whole lot that I, I, I'm supposed to, to give. Okay, so there's, this, this relationship, if it's going to work at all, is very, very much a two-way street. Okay, it's good absolutely to receive the love of the other, which also can be a hard thing for some, but that's a different homily. R learning how to receive love, but learning how to give and learning how to serve is absolutely essential for a healthy marriage. And if we apply that to, you can apply that to any, any kind of a, a proper friendship as well, you know. In any friendship, if I head into any relationship, any friendship thinking, oh, this is great, now I'll be friends there with Katie because uh, her family is well connected and because of that, who knows, I might get a better job in a bigger parish with a bigger church and a bigger collection <laughs> or whatever it is, you know. And so I'm friends with that person because I want to get, I want to get. And then it might be that, that she's in need. I'm like, yeah, I'm busy, okay. <laughs> I'm busy. Yeah, you have your needs. Wonderful. Go get counselling. Find a friend. Call a girl, you know, rather than thinking, well, she's my friend. So I'm supposed to take care of her because if friendship is real, it's, it's two-way. It's two-way. Now, apply the same idea to our friendship or our, our relationship with God. I think it's very common to head into a relationship with God thinking, he's there to take care of my needs. He's there to resolve my problems. He's there to, as he promised, you know, to heal the sick and give sight to the blind and heal the lame and the dumb and the lepers and the whole lot. So that's what his job is in my life. God's job in my life is to serve me and my needs. Right, so I bring him a need and he doesn't answer it. What is your problem? Why aren't you doing what you said you would do? This is a stupid friendship. This is a stupid relationship. I'll take care of it myself. And so then this, this relationship with God becomes very, well, empty. It's not really a relationship. It was the, the relationship between me and, I don't know, a divine vending machine who's supposed to give me the stuff I want when I want it. But woe betide him if he were to ask anything of me. If God were to ask anything of me, I think some, many of us would think, whoa, oh, hold on, oh, hold on. I thought your job here was to kind of serve me and my needs. What are you doing asking me for stuff? That's not the deal. That's not, that's not how I understood this relationship at all now. And so then we have this relationship with God, which is really, really stunted and fake and a kind of a, a, an empty, hollow shell of what it should be. Imagine, 
if in your life, imagine if in our prayer lives, in our relationship with God, we were to pray, Lord, here I am, I come to do your will. That's, that, that, for, for many of us, might actually turn on its head this relationship with God. Hang on, I'm supposed to do your will? We're the, we're the idea that we're supposed to ask God what he wants and that I would adjust my life and the course of my life according to his will. That's, that's very, very different to how many of us might see our relationship with God. And this is what we hear in our, in our first reading. Beautiful reading from the uh, first book of Samuel where Samuel, as a, as a young boy in the temple, he's there with, 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 with Eli and he hears at, at night this, this voice, Samuel, Samuel. And he goes to Eli and says, you call me? Eli says, no, it wasn't me. Go back to sleep. And it happens again and it happens again. The third time, Eli recognizes this isn't, if this isn't me calling, who is calling? It's God calling him. And so the last time then, after Samuel hears that voice, he responds, here I am, Lord. I come to do your will. I come to do your will. This is also the, the, the verse of our psalm. Here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. This is a, a much more wholesome way of looking at our relationship with God. I mean, you think of any, any parent. When, when, you, when, you, when you're parents of uh, three, four, five-year-olds, it may be that on occasion, probably not very common, but your five-year-old might, op- might offer to help you doing anything, you know, cleaning up, baking, cooking, I don't know. Uh, but a five-year-old helping you, right, is usually not much of a help, okay? Your five-year-old helping you can be mayhem. Imagine like you're cutting the grass outside and your five-year-old wants to help you. What will he do? I mean, he'll get a fistful of grass, drop half it wherever he's going and dump it into his sister's face. You know what I mean? It'll be, it's like your five-year-old helping you isn't going to be much of a help. Okay, but there does come a point in, in your life where maybe in your teens, in the, the child's teens, they can absolutely wash the car and hoover the dining room and clean up the bathroom and maybe even cook a meal. No, that, that's impossible today. No, okay, we'll skip cooking. Um, whatever they can do, you know, they can, they can clean windows. They can, you know, and it's, that's good. But then there'll actually be a, a point in their 20s where your son or your daughter might actually know more about certain things than you do. Like I remember when, you know, when I started at home and like my mom would have a problem with the computer or the TV or the, the VCR back in the day and had no idea how to tune, how can you tune that thing in? Uh, uh, you know, and I, I knew more about tech than they did. So being given small responsibilities in, in our youth and then we eventually grow to a point where we can, we can actually be of service. We can actually help. We can actually contribute to family life meaningfully. So the, the, the Lord, what is he doing? He, he entrusts us with little things at the beginning of our faith journey. But as we grow up, he wants us to grow up in the faith as well. Do you know what I mean? When we were like baptized or when we received the first Holy Communion or Confirmation, we are very young in the faith, so he doesn't trust us with much. He does ask us to pray daily and does ask us to come to Mass weekly, but there's no great responsibility here. But as we grow up, he expects us, he wants us to grow up, become adults in the faith, and not just have this, you know, I prayed once a week and I went to Mass on Sunday attitude in our 60s. Do you know, we're, we should have grown up, we should be growing up in our faith. And the main hindrance to that, I think, is, is this reluctance, reluctance to say, Lord, what do you want? What do you want of me? Here I am. I come to do your will. And if, if we can pray that, then I think we'll see great growth in our spiritual life. And there are two things, two points I want to make just on, on, on that. If we say to the Lord, here I am, I come to do your will, there are, we look at two possible outcomes. We won't look at them. There could be more, but we haven't time. We look at two. One, he may ask you to absolutely stay on the track you're on. Here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. He's not asking you to leave your wife and children and become a hermit. Right? He may ask you, you're on the right track, stay going. 
just like Google Maps. Just because you look at Google Maps doesn't mean you have to actually take an exit and turn. Maybe you're on the right road for the next 70 kilometers. Just stay going. Just stay going. Right, so you're on the right track. Great, here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. Father Patrick, stay being a priest. Okay. There you go. So there's not, nothing to change. Great. Now it also may be, here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. Then the Lord says, all right, okay, now that, now, all right, now that you're listening to me, okay, sit down. <laughs> We've got a bit of work to do. And he may absolutely change your plans. He may absolutely change your plans. When you think of um, Father Maximilian Kolbe, <coughs> who went on to become Saint Maximilian Kolbe, um, he became a priest, a Franciscan in, in, in Poland. I don't think he had any great plans to change the world. He just wanted to be a friar, like many friars that he knew. But he had this desire and this ability to, to write about saints and to describe their lives. And so he put together this, this little magazine which was, was, was printed and became very, very popular in order to defend the church against Freemasonry, which was rife at the time. And so he'd print this, uh, this, this, this magazine and spread it around, and he could see that he had, he had drive, he had ability, he had, he had leadership, he had a fire in his belly to, to win souls for Christ. And so he went to Japan and started a, a mission there for the Franciscans in Nagasaki on the other side of, of the hill from where the, the bomb dropped. So the, the friary was unharmed after the bombing at the end of the war. And he was brought back to Europe. He was in a place called Niepokalano uh, in Poland. And uh, it's a Franciscan community. Absolutely stunning work. It was, it was, it was a huge, huge Franciscan community. And at the end of the war, or well, towards at the, at the end of the war in '41, uh, he was—he knew this was coming. He knew that the Gestapo, the, 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 the Nazis, were becoming very, very intolerant to his opposition of Hitler's rule and of Hitler's behaviour and Hitler's invasions. And he was vocal about it. And so he knew this was coming. He was warned. Many of the other friars had left already. But he decided to stay, and he was arrested, brought to Auschwitz, and then offered his life in the place of a man who had escaped. And the Gestapo, in response to, to this, these escapees, uh, was to sentence ten men to death by starvation in the starvation bunkers. He offered his life in place of this one particular man who pleaded for mercy, pleaded that he could go back to his family. Maximilian Kolbe offered his life for, for, for him and indeed was sent to the hunger bunkers where he died. Was this his plan? Was this how he had set out to live his priesthood? No. But here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. And then after his life, he becomes a, just an incredible saint, an incredible inspiration. And 70 years later, we're still talking about his life and his death and his witness and his courage. Here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. The Lord has a plan which is much greater than our own plan. It's greater, it's better than our own plan. And it's a plan that if we live correctly, may actually continue after our lives, after we have died, our mission and our influence and our, the inspiration of our lives, hopefully, continues after we have died. So this, this plan, God's plan, isn't just for the duration of your stay here on earth. God's plan for your life goes on after your death. So if we live this, here I am, Lord, I come to do your will, it's, it's stunning. It's beautiful. It's life-giving. It's needed today. The Lord needs people who will say, here I am, Lord, I come to do your will, because I trust you. And again, all, all of you parents of teenagers, what a gift it would be for your teenage son or daughter or to come and say, Dad, do you need anything? Do you need anything done? Is that anything I can do for you? I mean, ye changed my nappies and brought me to school and brought me to hurling and brought me to the swimming pool and brought me to karate training and ballet and GAA and the hairdressers and ye paid for my fake nails and eyebrows. That's the daughters, by the way. Uh, you paid for, my, for everything. 
Is there anything I can do? Shouldn't we have the same relationship with our Heavenly Father? Lord, you have provided everything for me. Is there anything I can do? I've come to do your will. And I trust that your will is good for me. I trust that your will won't overwhelm me. I trust you. The Lord is far more than a GPS. He's far more than Google Maps. His timing and his direction, his indications are perfect. So Lord, we ask you today to grant us that selflessness, that love and that courage to simply respond yes to your call. Here I am, Lord. I come to do your will. Amen.